everyone, welcome back. Um, I hope everyone's still uh, keeping safe and well and you're enjoying the story. It's time for another chapter. I'm sat in the garden today, um, trying to enjoy the sunshine. Um, so you might hear some birds tweeting and things like that, but that's okay. Okay, chapter four of The Secret Dragon by Ed Clark. Let's go. Mary sat at her desk. If the beach was her hunting ground, the bedroom was the nest she brought all her treasures back to. Ammonites, brachiopods and trilobites lined the shelves and fossil pictures messily papered every spare patch of wall. There were meticulous pencil drawings that Mary had sketched herself. A photograph from Tlamwerith Post of Mary showing TV paleontologist Dr Griff Griffiths from Dinosaur Hunt the Anangela she had found with her dad and in pride of place on her bedside table, the Anangela itself. But nowhere was there a picture that remotely resembled the creature now warming its cold blood in the spotlight of her angle poised lamp, like a lizard on a sun-drenched wall. Mary leafed through the pages of her mother's natural history book. It showed 5,000 species, all beautifully illustrated. She had worked her way through the entire section on reptiles but had drawn a complete blank. Mary frowned. If this wasn't a living creature that anyone knew of, could it be one that was believed to be extinct? It wouldn't have been the first time that had happened. Back in the 1930s, a woman named Marjorie Courtenay Latimer had discovered a fish which had, they thought had been extinct for 65 million years. They called that a living fossil. Mary reached for her glossy signed copy of Dr. Griff's The Dinosaur Hunter. It had a picture of him on the front wearing a leather biker jacket and crouching next to a dusty fossilised skeleton. Inside it was bursting with full coloured diagrams and illustrations of dinosaurs and their remains. She held the book open next to the winged creature and whipped through the pages trying to find a match. The reptile looked on curiously until Mary finally ran out of pages and let the book fall shut. So. If you're not an animal that's alive today, she said to the quizzical lizard, and you're not an animal that's extinct either, what on earth are you? She wished she could have asked her dad about it. There's no way he would have known. Of course, she said out loud, immediately jumping out of her chair. She pulled open her wardrobe and reached into the darkest recesses at the back. She hauled out a battered cardboard box, barely held together with brown packing tape and spread the contents around the, on the floor. They were her dad's old geology books and magazines, which she'd managed to stop her mum taking to the charity shop. First she worked her way through a pile of books, principles of geology, the ancient changes of the earth, rock trails of South Wales, nothing there. Mary next rifled through a pile of his dog-eared International Journal of Science magazines, the molecular tuning of electroreception in sharks, she didn't even know what that meant. Dark days of the Triassic, the lost world. Maybe it was about an asteroid that might have wiped out the whole species in South Wales 200 mil million years ago. It talked about lizards that looked like monkeys and crocodiles that walked upright like dogs. But there was no reference to two-legged reptiles with wings. She slumped to the carpet in despair. But then she noticed an old hardback book hidden beneath the magazines. She pushed back the journals and held up the book to the light. At one time, it would have been a deep wine colour all over, but decades of exposure to the sunlight had faded the spine to a pale pink. A dragon was embossed on the front cover. Mary turned the book over in her hands to read the gold print on the spine. Folklore and Folk Stories of Wales by Mary Trev Trevelyan. This wasn't a book about natural history or a scientific magazine. It was a book about legends. What was it even doing in her dad's box? She opened the cover and in a child's handwriting saw an inscription. Jonathan Jones, September 1990. It was her father's book, but from when he was a boy, the same age as Mary was now. He slid, she, her fingers slid across the chapter headings, water horses and spirits of the mist corpse candles and phantom funerals, weird ladies and their work. Mary snorted. It was all ridiculous, made up creatures just to scare little children. But then her finger came to rest on chapter eight, dragons 
serpents and snakes. And curiosity got the better of her. She flipped to the relevant section, the unmistakable stale scent of old paper wafting up to her nose. And there, on the first page of the chapter, she found it. Not a photograph or a painting, but an intricate drawing of a winged dragon with a long tail and two clawed legs. Underneath was written the caption, Gwibber or Wyvern. Marily hungrily scanned the text that followed. An aged inhabitant of Penlyn, who died a few years ago, said that in his boyhood the winged serpents were described as very beautiful. They were coiled when in repose and looked as though they were covered with jewels of all sorts. Some of them had crests sparkling with all the colours of the rainbow. Mary stopped reading and looked across at the creature. She angled the lamp to shine on its crest. Just as it had on the beach, the crest sparkled with colour. It looked exactly like the picture in the book. The creature opened one eye, as if it knew it had been found out. Gweba, Mary said quietly to herself with her best Welsh pronunciation. You're a Gweba. She turned back to the book. He said it was no old story invented to frighten children, but a real fact. His father and uncles had killed some of them, for they were as bad as foxes for poultry. The Gweba stretched out its claws, opened its jaws wide, and yawned. You're not an old story either, Mary whispered to the serpent, reaching out to let it curl its tail around her finger again. You're very real. But how could a creature have thought fictionally, fiction, but how could a creature thought fictional actually be fact? How could science not know about it? Questions led to more questions and made her head spin. How had it survived encased in rock? Was it some kind of epic hibernation? Was it possible that this creature was still alive? Then, slowly, a new realisation began to seep into her brain. This animal would cause a sensation. This was no dinosaur skeleton or even a living fossil. This was a mythical creature, a living, breathing dragon lying beneath the desk lamp in her bedroom on Dimland Cross Farm. Mary's mind really began to whir now. This wouldn't just make the front page of the science journal, it would hit news headlines all around the world. Maybe the reptile would even get named after her, like the Anangela was for Mary Anning. Probably something in Latin like Terra Draco Mary. This was her chance to be a real scientist, to be who she wanted to be. A lump rose in Mary's throat as she remembered her father's words to her. She instinctively reached out for his name, embossed in biro at the front of the book. She ran her fingers across it, imagining his 11-year-old self carefully writing the letters tongue pushing against the inside of his cheek in concentration. She wished more than anything that he could be here to share this moment with her. And that's when she thought of it. An idea so perfect and fitting, it chased away her sadness. She would name this new species after her dad. Terra Draco Jonathini, Jonathan's dragon. That way, he would share in this moment with her. They would go down in scientific history together, and in some way, maybe this little creature might bring a part of him back to life. But just as her heart warmed to this feeling, worry started creeping into her head. The second she showed the dragon to anyone, it would be taken away, and she would never see it again. She knew what happened to Mary Anning. No one had believed her when she first discovered an ichthyosaur skeleton, but she was a woman. And then, after she convinced them, male scientists had taken all the credit. Mary's heart sank at the thought. She couldn't let that happen to her. It had to be the name she had chosen. The name that would commemorate her father and no one else. Terra Draco Jonathini. Still, she knew she couldn't do this alone. She needed an adult to help her. And that definitely wasn't her mum. She'd never believe Mary could be trusted to look after a living creature. And anyway, she was more interested in this new vet than in remembering Mary's dad. Mary glanced over her dinosaur hunter book and pulled it down from her desk. Inside was another inscription, a dedication that read, Keep digging, Mary. One day I'll be working for you, from Dr. Griff. 
Yes, Dr. Griff would understand. He was a scientist too, after all, and one who worked with young people, listened to their opinions and took them seriously. She would take the dragon to him, and together they would march up the steps of the Natural History Museum in London and tell those experts that everything they thought they knew was wrong. Her dad would be so proud of her. But how would she find Dr. Griff? It wasn't going to be easy. Then she looked back at the newspaper cutting of them together. It was a book signing at her school last year. He must visit schools all the time, and do talks for the public too. Maybe the fact that he was famous would actually make it easier to track him down. Stay there, Teradraco Terra Jonathini, she ordered with a finger point. Not that you can understand a word I'm saying. The dragon looked back up innocently as Mary slipped sideways out of the door before tiptoeing quickly down the stairs. Fortunately, Rian was watching Country File in the living room. For once, Mary was glad. For the next hour, her mum would sit there, riveted by tales of poorly pigs, beetroot blight, or the latest advances in llama farming. Still, Mary was as quiet as possible as she slid a dusty old computer bag out of the cupboard by the door before creeping up the stairs, two at a time, and back through her bedroom door. Where was the dragon? It was no longer basking under the lamp on her desk. She scanned the room, but he was nowhere to be seen. Her eyes flicked to the window, and her stomach lurched. The top part was slightly open. How could she have been so stupid? She rushed over and searched the sky for any signs of the missing creature. Nothing. Then, Mary heard a tap, and then another. She looked down at the windowsill and saw the dragon behind the curtain. It was hopping and flapping its wings in a vain attempt to fly out through the glass. Ah, <sighs> she breathed a sigh of relief and slowly pulled the window above her shut. Not that there was any danger of the dragon reaching up that high. Clearly flying was not a skill it had mastered yet. As she watched, it bounced off the window pane again and fell on the sill, looking dazed. Mary knocked on the glass with her knuckle to demonstrate that it was completely solid. You can't get out that way, she said. Best stay inside where it's warm. Delicately, she cupped her hands around the dragon and placed it back underneath her lamp, where it curled up seemingly contented enough to stay put, for the moment at least. Mary slid a battered old laptop out of the computer bag. It buzzed and whirred like it had cogs inside instead of circuit boards before finally sparking unwillingly to life. Mary googled Dr. Griff Griffiths. It took forever, but a list of results finally pinged onto the screen. She scrolled down until one in particular caught her eye. She clicked on the link. It was almost too good to be true. On the screen was a web page advertising a conference on progressive paleontology at a Cardiff hotel. Dr. Griff was due to address the conference at 2 p.m. the very next day. Mary grinned. Perfect. And there we go. That's the end of chapter four. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you soon for chapter five. Bye-bye.